Welcome to the Ultimate Sports Blog Podcast. Today is Monday, May 14th, 2018. Today I'm going to recap yesterday's Cavs Celtics Game 1, look ahead and predict Game 1 of the Western Conference Finals between the Rockets and the Warriors from Houston, go over yesterday's Game 2 between the Capitals and the Lightning, and look ahead and predict tonight's Game 2 between the Vegas Golden Knights and the Winnipeg Jets from Winnipeg. Go over yesterday in baseball, look ahead to today's baseball games, go over my power rankings for the week, my players of the week, and my second MLB mock draft. Here we go. The Celtics defeat the Cavaliers 108-83 to take a 1-0 series lead. Big time win for the Celtics. Jalen Brown put up 23 points to win. Kevin Love put up 17 to defeat. LeBron had his worst game of the playoffs. He only scored 15 points. And the Cavs actually made this semi-interesting because they cut a big lead into a 14-point deficit going into the fourth quarter. But give the Celtics credit. They rebounded from a poor third quarter and outscored them 30-19 to in the fourth quarter. But re- what really saved the Celtics in this game was the big first quarter in which they outscored Cleveland 36-18. to They absolutely dominated that first quarter. Brad Stevens is just phenomenal. He's the best coach in the NBA right now, and he deserves all the credit in the world, although the players deserve credit too because they've played great. Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum has been phenomenal in this run. Al Horford has been playing great all around too. A bunch of their role players. Marcus Morris is hitting big shots. Aaron Baines has been rebounding for them a lot. And I'm very fascinated for Game 2 tomorrow night, which I will preview and predict on tomorrow's podcast. Tonight you have the Warriors and the Rockets, Game 1, 9 o'clock, TNT. Marv Albert, Reggie Miller, Chris Reber, and David Aldridge on the call. This is going to be a fun series. I took Golden State in 6. But I have a funny feeling Houston comes out and wins Game 1. I think they're going to be motivated at home. James Harden's had a couple subpar games in a row. I think he'll be motivated. Chris Paul's going to be motivated. The role players are going to hit their shots. And I think Houston's going to win, let's say, 120 to 115. I think it's going to be a great game. And James Harden will reverse his little playoff narrative for at least one game here and the biggest stage in the Western Conference Finals against the reigning world champion Golden State Warriors. So give me the Rockets, again, 120 to 115, as I think it will come down to free throw shooting at the end of the game. Stanley Cup playoffs. Another impressive road win for the Washington Capitals, 6-2 over the Tampa Bay Lightning to take a 2-0 series lead. This is absolutely shocking to me considering that Tampa had home ice advantage and, to me, were the better team coming into the series. But give Alex Ovechkin and Braden Holpe and even Barry Trotz a lot of credit for this. And they have Tampa pretty much on the ropes as Tampa has to at least win a couple games in Washington in order to come back and win the series. First period, Tom Wilson, 28 seconds into the game. His third of the playoffs, assisted by Matt Niskanen and Evgeny Kuznetsov, 1-0 caps. Braden points fifth of the playoffs on the power play, assisted by Steven Stamkos and Victor Hedman, 1-1. Steven Stamkos is fifth of the playoffs on the power play, assisted by Nikita Kucherov and Braden Point gave the Bolts a 2-1 lead. Second period, Devontae smith Pelly's third of the playoffs, assisted by Alex Chiasson and John Carlson tied up at two apiece. Washington took over from there. Lars Eller's fifth of the playoffs, assisted by Jacob Verana, 3-2 Washington. And three seconds before the second intermission, Evgeny Kuznetsov's eighth of the playoffs on the power play, assisted by Alex Ovechkin and Lars Eller, 4-2 caps. Third period, Alex Ovechkin's tenth of the playoffs, assisted by Evgeny Kuznetsov and Tom Wilson, 5-2 caps. Brett Connolly's third of the playoffs, assisted by Lars Eller and John Carlson, 6-2 caps was your final. Braden Holpe, again, was really good in this game. 33 saves on 35 shots. Andre Vasilevsky, 
31 saves on 37 shots. Surprised that Tampa didn't pull him again, but that's okay, I guess. So give the Capitals credit. I'm tempted to say that Alex Ovechkin has passed Marc-Andre Fleury as the favorite for the Conn Smythe Trophy, considering that Washington's already up 2-0. Fleury hasn't been as great as he was in his first couple playoff games in Game 1 against the Jets and in Game, I believe it was 4 against San Jose. But I expect Fleury to rebound. We'll see how the far the Knights and the Caps go to determine who the Conn Smythe favorite should be. Evgeny Kuznetsov's obviously in that conversation as well as Braden Holpe. Tonight you have the Golden Knights at the Jets, 8 o'clock, NBCSN, Kenny Albert, Joe Micheletti, Pierre Maguire on the call. Should be an interesting game. Will the Vegas Golden Knights bounce back and even up at one apiece, or will the Winnipeg Jets go up 2-0? I think the Jets go up 2-0. They're home. They've been unbelievable at home in the playoffs with the exception of those games against the Predators in Game 6 when they had a chance to close out Nashville at home and in Game 4 when they had a chance to go up 3-1 against Nashville. But give them credit, they went into Nashville and defeated the Predators and then they turn around and beat the Golden Knights in Game 1. Give me the Jets 4-3 in overtime with a game winner by Patrick Lane. So I think the Winnipeg Jets will go up 2-0 in this best of seven series in the Western Conference Finals. Baseball yesterday. A lot of interesting results. The Yankees defeated the Athletics 6-2 as they improved to 28-12, tied for the best record of baseball with the Red Sox. The Athletics dropped to 19-21. Luis Severino with the win. Brett Anderson with the loss. Bottom of the first, two-run single, Giancarlo Stanton. 2 nothing Yankees. RBI single, Aaron Hicks. 3 nothing Yankees. Top of the fifth, RBI single, Jed Lowry. Makes it 3-1 Yankees. Bottom of the fifth, a home run by Giancarlo Stanton. Makes it 4-1 Yankees. Bottom of the seventh, fielder's choice, Aaron Hicks. 5-1 Yankees. Bottom of the eighth, an RBI single by Aaron Judge. 6-1 Yankees in the top of the ninth. A home run by Mark Canna made it 6-2. The Yankees avoided a roll as Chapman, even though Canna hit the home run. And the Yankees hold on for the win. Luis Severino, six innings, five hits, an earned run, two walks, and seven strikeouts. Leaves the game with a 2.14 ERA. Brett Anderson, a very poor outing again. Five innings, eight hits, four and runs, two walks, and four strikeouts. Leaves the game with a 8.16 ERA. The Orioles destroyed the Rays 17 to 1 as they improved the 13 and 28. Tampa drops to 16 and 22. Dylan Bundy with the win, Blake Snell with the loss. Good bounce back for Dylan Bundy after that horrendous outing against the Royals. I have to give Bundy some credit there. Bottom of the second home run, Danny Valencia 1 nothing Orioles. Home run, Joey Rickard, 2 nothing Orioles. Home run, Trey Mancini, 3 nothing Orioles. Bottom of the third, Danny Valencia, fielder's choice, 4 nothing Orioles. Bottom of the fourth, RBI double, Manny Machado, 5 nothing O's. Two-run single, Jonathan Scope, 7 nothing Orioles. Infield single, Danny Valencia, 8 nothing Orioles. Three-run home run, Joey Rickard, 11 nothing Orioles. Bottom of the seventh, RBI ground out, Trey Mancini, 12 nothing Orioles. RBI double Manny Machado, 13 to nothing Orioles. RBI single Danny Valencia, 14 to nothing Orioles. RBI single Joey Rickard, 15 to nothing Orioles. Two run double Craig Gentry, 17 0 Orioles. And the Rays get a garbage run on an RBI single by Denard Span to make it 17 to 1. Like I mentioned before, a much better outing by Dylan Bundy. Seven innings, two hits, and no word runs. Four walks and seven strikeouts leaves the game with a 4.53 ERA. Blake Snell had a very poor outing, his worst start of the year. Three and a third inning, six hits, five earned runs, two walks, and three strikeouts leaves the game with a 3.12 ERA. And the bullpen was probably worse than Snell by giving up all those runs. The Red Sox defeated the Blue Jays 5-3 as they improved to 28-12 and and are tied with the Yankees for the best record in baseball. Toronto drops to 21 and 20. 
Hector Velasquez with the win. Joe Biggiani with the loss. Joe Kelly with the save. Top of the first, the two-run home run by J.D. Martinez, 2-0 Sox. Top of the third, bases loaded walk. Mitch Moreland, 3-0 Sox. Top of the fifth, RBI single, J.D. Martinez, 4-0 Sox. Bottom of the fifth, a two-run double by Justin Smoke, 4-2 Sox. RBI single, Russell Martin, 4-3 Sox. Top of the eighth, an insurance run for the Red Sox and an RBI ground out by Xander Bogarts. 5-3 Red Sox was your final. Drew Pomeranz, four innings, five hits, three earned runs, five walks, and six strikeouts, leaves the game with a 5.47 ERA. Joe Biggiani, four and two-thirds innings, four hits, four earned runs, three walks, and three strikeouts, leaves the game with a 7.98 ERA. Toronto really should put Biggiani in their bullpen. I think he's better built for the bullpen than as a starter because I thought he was really effective the last few years out of the pen rather than as a starter. The Indians defeated the Rails 11-2 as they improved the 2019 Casey drops to 13-27. and Corey Kluber with the win, Danny Duffy with the loss. Bottom of the second, fielder's choice, Greg Allen, one off the Indians. Grounder in the fielder's choice, Michael Brantley, two nothing Indians. A three-run home run by Jose Ramirez, five nothing Indians. Bottom of the third RBI single, Francisco Lindor, 6 nothing Indians. Bottom of the fourth, a three-run home run by Jan Gomes, 9 nothing Indians. Top of the sixth, RBI double, Salvador Perez, 9-1 Indians. RBI single, Whit Merrifield, 9-2 Indians. Bottom of the seventh, a two-run home run by Michael Brantley, 11-2 Indians. That was your final. Corey Kluber was great. Seven innings, eight hits. No one runs, no walks, and four strikeouts leaves the game with a 2.34 ERA. Danny Duffy was not good. Three and a third innings, eight hits, nine and runs, five walks, and two strikeouts leaves the game with a 6.51 ERA. The Tigers defeat the Mariners 5 to 4 as they improve to 17 and 22. Seattle drops to 22 and 17. Shane Green with the win. Juan Nancasio with the loss. Top of the second home run, Corey Seeger, one off the Mariners. Bottom of the third. RBI single, Mickey Matoke, 1-1. RBI ground out, Pete Cosma, 2-1 Tigers. Top of the fourth, an RBI single by D. Gordon, ties it up at two apiece. Bottom of the fifth, a home run by Nick Goodrum, 3-2 Tigers. Bottom of the seventh, an RBI double by Mickey Matoke, 4-2 Tigers. Top of the eighth, a two-run single by Gene Segura, ties it up at four apiece. And in the bottom of the ninth, a walk-off single by Jose Iglesias, 5-4 Tigers, your final. Blaine Hardy. Was okay in his big league debut. Four and a third innings, eight hits. Two earned runs, a walk, and three strikeouts. Leaves the game with a 3.52 ERA. James Paxton coming off the no-hitter. Six innings, six hits, three runs, no walks, and four strikeouts. Leaves the game with a 3.52 ERA. The Braves defeated the Marlins 4-3 to as they improved to a National League best, 24-15. and The Marlins dropped to 14-26. and Sean Newcomb with the win. Jose Urena with the loss. Arodis Viciano with the save. Top of the first, RBI single, Nick Marcakis, one off in Braves. Top of the sixth, a two run home run by Enderian Ciarte. Three nothing Braves. Top of the ninth, Preston Tucker, RBI single. Four nothing Braves. Bottom of the ninth, a home run by Justin Bohr, a three run shot, made it a 4 3 game to make things interesting there for Miami. Sean Newcomb was great. Six innings, one hit, no one runs, four walks, and six strikeouts. Leaves the game with a 2.51 ERA. Jose Urena, six innings, four hits, three earned runs, two walks, and five strikeouts. Leaves the game with a 4.38 ERA. The Phillies defeated the Mets 4-2 to two, as they improved to 23-16. and 16. The Mets dropped to 19-18. and 18. Aaron Nola with the win. Paul Seawall with the loss. Edubre Ramos with the save. Top of the sixth. A home run by Yoenis Cespedes got the Mets on the board, one nothing. Bottom of the sixth, a three-run home run by Nick Williams gave the Phillies a 3-1 lead. Top of the seventh, RBI double as Durbo Cabrera, 3-2 Phillies. Bottom of the eighth, home run Carlos Santana, 4-2 Phillies is your final. Aaron Nola was okay. Gave up a lot of hits and walked a couple guys, but still a solid game. Six innings, nine hits, an earned run. Two walks and four strikeouts leaves the game with a 1.99 ERA. Jacob DeGrom only lasted an inning. That's because 
It was for, for precautionary reasons. He threw 45 pitches. Didn't give up a hit or a run. But he walked a couple guys. He walked three. And he struck out two. Left the game, though, with a 1.83 or away. Roberto Gasselman was okay in relief. Three innings, three hits. No one runs, two walks, and two strikeouts. Seawald was the one that gave up the big home run to Nick Williams. Two innings, three hits, three and runs, a walk, and a strikeout. Ramos pitched a good seventh inning. Horacio's Familia gave up the home run to Carlos Santana. The Giants defeated the Pirates 5 nothing as they improved to 20-21 and to avoid a sweep by the Pirates and going over on their road trip. And the Pirates dropped to 23-17. and Derek Holland with the win. Aval Novo with the loss. Top of the sixth is when the Giants scored all their runs. Home run. Gorkis Hernandez, 1-0 Giants, top of the sixth, RBI double, Brandon Crawford, 2-0 Giants, top of the sixth, a three-run home run by Nick Hundley, 5-0 Giants, your final, Derek Holland, six in the third innings, four hits, no one runs, five walks, and seven strikeouts, leaves the game with a 4.79 in array, Yvonne Nova, Five and two-thirds innings, eight hits, four and runs, no walks, and two strikeouts. Leaves the game with a 5.01 ERA. The Astros defeated the Rangers 6-1 to as they improved to 26-16. and The Rangers dropped to 16-26. and Dallas Keiko with the win. Matt Moore with the loss. Bottom of the third, RBI single. Yuli Gurriel, one off the Astros. Two-run home run, Evan Gaddis, three off the Astros. Bottom of the seventh. Two-run home run, Carlos Correa, 5 nothing Astros. Sacrifice by Derek Fisher, 6 nothing Astros. Top of the eighth, home run, Carlos Perez, made it 6-1 Astros. That was your final. Dallas Keuchel with perhaps his best outing of the season. Seven innings, three hits, no one runs a walk, and eight strikeouts leaves the game with a 3.1 ERA. Matt Moore only lasted three innings. He gave up six hits, three and runs, three walks, and five strikeouts leaves the game with a 7.82 ERA. The White Sox defeated the Cubs 5 to 3 to snap their 7 game losing streak as they improved to 10 and 27. The Cubs dropped to 21 and 16. Lucas Giolito with the win, Kyle Hendricks with the loss, Bruce Rendon with the save. Bottom of the first a two-run single by Javier Baez, 2 nothing Cubs. Top of the second home run Matt Davidson made it 2-1 Cubs. Top of the third RBI single Yolmer Sanchez, 2-2 game. Bottom of the fourth RBI double Ian Happ, 3-2 Cubs. Top of the sixth RBI triple by Nicky Delmonico made it a 3-3 game. Sacrifice by Matt Davidson, 4-3 White Sox. Top of the seventh, RBI single by Leury Garcia, 5-3 White Sox was your final. Lucas Giolito, a wacky line. Five and two-thirds innings, two hits, three runs, seven walks, and three strikeouts. Leaves the game with a 6.91 ERA. Kyle Hendricks, six innings, six hits, three runs, no walks, and six strikeouts. Leaves the game with a 3.2 ERA. The Brewers feed the Rockies seven to three as they improve to twenty four and seventeen. The Rockies drop to twenty two and nineteen. Freddie Peralta with the win in his big league debut. John Gray with the loss. Freddie Peralta actually took a no hit bid into the sixth inning of this game. Top of the second, ground rule double. Tyler Salandino one nothing Brewers. Two run single. Christian Yelich three nothing Brewers. Top of the third, home run. Travis Shaw four nothing Brewers. Top of the sixth, a three run home run by. Jesus Aguilar, 7 nothing Brewers. Bottom of the 7th, home run Tony Wolters, made it 7-1 Brewers. Bottom of the 8th, a 2-run home run by David Dahl. 7-3 Brewers was your final. Freddie Peralta's line, 5 and 2 thirds innings, 1 hit, no more runs, 2 walks, and 13 strikeouts, has a 0 ERA. John Gray, not good, 5 and a third innings, 10 hits, 6 earned runs, no walks, but 10 strikeouts. Leaves the game with the 4.85 ERA. The Angels defeat the Twins 2-1 as they improve to 24-16. and 16. The Twins drop to 17-19. and 19. Blake Parker with the win, Zach Duke with the loss. Bottom of the fifth, fielder's choice, Justin Upton. one nothing Angels, top of the seventh, RBI single, Joe Maurer, 1-1. Bottom of the ninth, a walk-off RBI single by Zach Cozart. Gave the Angels a 2-1 win. Shohei Otani was brilliant yet again. Six in the third innings, three hits, one earned run, two walks, 11 strikeouts. Leaves the game to 3.5 ADRA. Fernando Romero was good again in his third start. 
Five innings, four hits, and earned run three walks and six strikeouts. Leaves the game with a .54 ERA. The Reds defeated the Dodgers 5-3 to three to win their sixth in a row and to sweep the Dodgers. That's very impressive. Luis Castillo with the win. Rich Hill with the loss. Rossiel Iglesias with the save. Top of the third, a two-run home run by Eugenio Suarez. 2 nothing Reds. Bottom of the third, home run. Yasiel Puig made a 2-1 Reds. Top of the fourth, sacrifice to the pitcher by Alex Blandino. 3-1 Reds. Top of the sixth, a two-run home run by Joey Votto. 5-1 Reds. Bottom of the seventh, a home run by Yasmani Grandal. 5-2 Reds. RBI ground out Chris Taylor. 5-3 Reds was your final. Luis Castillo, six innings, four hits, two runs, no walks, and eight strikeouts. Leaves the game with a 6.02 ERA. Rich Hill, five and two-thirds innings, six hits, two and runs, four walks, and four strikeouts. Leaves the game with a 6.2 ERA. I'm going to have some words for the Dodgers when I do the power rankings in a couple minutes. The Padres defeat the Cardinals 5-3 to three as they improve to 16-26. and 26. The Cardinals drop to 22-16. and 16. Clayton Richard with the win. Adam Wainwright with the loss. Brad Hand with the save. Bottom of the third, RBI single, Corey Spagenberg, 1-0 Padres. Sacrifice fly, Freddy Galvis, 2-0 Padres. Bottom of the fourth, RBI double, Jose Perella, 3-0 Padres. RBI single, Frankie Cadero, 4-0 Padres. Top of the sixth, RBI triple, Harrison Bader, 4-1 Padres. Top of the sixth as well, RBI single, Jose Martinez, 4-2 Padres. Bottom of the eighth. Sacrifice by Carlos Asuje, 5-2 Padres. Top of the ninth, home run Harrison Bader, 5-3 Padres was your final. Clayton Richard, 8 innings, 5 hits, 2 earned runs, a walk and 10 strikeouts. Leaves the game with a 5.2 ERA. That was his best start of the year. Adam Wainwright didn't last very long in his return game. He was not very good. 2 and a third innings, 3 hits, 2 earned runs, 6 walks and 3 strikeouts. Leaves the game with an ERA of 4. Last but not least, the Nationals defeat the Diamondbacks six to four to complete a four-game sweep. The Nationals improved the twenty-four and eighteen. The Diamondbacks dropped the twenty-four and sixteen. Ryan Madsen with the win. Archie Bradley with the loss. Sean Doolittle with the save. Top of the first RBI single. Howie Kendrick one nothing Nats. Top of the third, a long home run by Bryce Harper. Two nothing Nats. Bottom of the third RBI triple. David Peralta. 2-1 Nats. Top of the fifth home run, Trey Turner. 3-1 Nats. Top of the sixth home run, Mark Reynolds. New addition to the Nats. 4-1 Nats. Bottom of the seventh, a two-run single by Gerard Dyson makes it 4-3. RBI double by Daniel Descalso. Ties it up at four apiece. Top of the eighth, Matt Reynolds again. This time with a two-run shot. 6-4. Nats is your final. Jeremy Hellickson, who's been great this season, Five innings, three hits, an earned run, a walk, and five strikeouts. Leaves the game with a 2.2 ERA. Zach Godley, six and a third innings, seven hits, four earned runs, a walk, and six strikeouts. Leaves the game with a 4.08 ERA. Today's games, a lot of teams with off days, and some of them well-deserved. Braves, Cubs, Julio Tehran, and Jose Quintana. And that's a 2.20 game. Rays Royals, 7 o'clock ESPN. Ryan Yarbrough against Eric Skoglund. This is going to be a high-scoring affair. I don't understand why ESPN is airing such a bad game. I would have chosen Mariners Twins over that game. I would have chosen Athletics Red Sox over that game solely because of the presence of the Red Sox. Or, if I were ESPN, what I would have really done was put your slot at 10 o'clock and air Astros Angels. That's the best game on the board today. But I'm going to take the Royals in a slugfest. And let's say 9-8 to eight is your final for tonight. I won't be shocked if Mike Moustakis goes deep a couple times. Whit Merrifield's played well for them. So, And on the flip side for Tampa Bay, this is one of their bullpen games. That's why I expect the Royals to put up a bunch of runs tonight. And I think they'll put up some runs tonight, too. Joey Wendell's been good for them. Daniel Robertson's been a nice role player. They have a couple other guys that are capable of driving in some runs. A Danny Heck of Rhea. So, there you go. 9-3 Royals book it. That's part of Maddie's picks. Athletics Red Sox. Sean Benaya and Rick Porcello. 
Indians, Tigers, Carlos Carrasco, and Mike Fires, Mariners, Twins, Wade LeBlanc, and Jake Odorizzi. Brewers, Diamondbacks, Jr., Guerrero, and Patrick Corbin. Astros, Angels, Lance McCullers, Jr. against Andrew Heaney. Rockies, Padres, you have Tyler Anderson and Joey Lucchesi. Last but not least, Reds, Giants. The Reds going for their seventh in a row. Sal Romano against Chris Stratton. Spoiler alert about the Reds. They are no longer the number 30 team on my power rankings. And speaking of the power rankings, let's get to it. Number 30 is a different team, a team that I think has underachieved a little bit this year that's going through a rebuild, though, that I thought was going to be better than expected, but that's not been the case thus far, and that's the Chicago White Sox, who sit in last place in the American League Central at 10-27. and 27. They endured a seven-game losing streak. They got swept by the Pirates at home. They could have easily won on Wednesday. And they lost two out of three to their city rival Cubs. The week ahead, they're off today at Pittsburgh for two. Then home for four against the Texas Rangers. I think three and three is a possibility here because the Rangers pitching is not very good. Although that's a team that can score a lot of runs. At Pittsburgh's going to be tricky because Pittsburgh's been overachieving so far and they tend to play better baseball at home than on the road. And quickly with the White Sox, Lucas Giolito's pitched a little bit better of late. He has very a hard time with throwing strikes. He walks a lot of guys. And I think the Nationals did the right thing by putting him in the deal for Adam Eaton. Although that trade's not looking too hot for the Nationals as Reynaldo Lopez has actually turned into a great player for the White Sox that they got back for Eaton. And let's face it, Eaton really hasn't played much as a National. He's been hurt all the time. So that's that. Number 29 is the Miami Marlins who sit in last place in the National League East with a record of 14-26. and 26. They got swept by the hands of the Cubs, and not only did they get swept, they got plummeled. They're competitive in the Tuesday game, but they no-showed on Monday and Wednesday, and they lost 3 out of 4 to the team with the best record in the National League in the Braves, although they did steal a game on Friday night. And they were competitive sort of yesterday by making that game a little interesting late with the Boar homer. This week, they host the Dodgers beginning tomorrow, and then they take on the Braves in Atlanta. One quick note about the Marlins, Harleen Garcia has regressed his last couple starts. I predicted that on my podcast a couple weeks ago when I did my predictions for May in Major League Baseball. I said that Harleen Garcia would regress, and I've been correct so far as he has turned in some subpar starts against the Cubs and the Braves, respectively, and... I won't be shocked if the Marlins might go 3-3 three and three with the Dodgers that are struggling, to say the least, coming in. They could easily pick them off twice. And the Braves are a division rival, even though the Braves just came into Miami and plummeted them. But to me, the more realistic thing is 2-4 and four for them. Number 28 is the suddenly streaking... Cincinnati Reds, who are 14-27 and 27 now on the season after winning their sixth straight game. They took two out of three from the Mets. And let's face it, Wednesday's game was courtesy of the Mets for batting out of order. And then give them credit going into Los Angeles and sweeping the Dodgers, although the Dodgers are ravaged by injuries and are not playing well at all. Their bullpen's been an atrocity. You'll get to more on the Dodgers in the moment. The Reds this week are at San Francisco beginning tonight, off day Thursday, then four games against the Cubs with a doubleheader on Saturday. One quick note on the Reds, Joey Votto's starting to play a lot better and playing like the guy that he was the last two years rather than the guy that he looked like in the beginning of the season. So I won't be shocked if Votto keeps this up and the Reds actually win a couple games. 
I think three and four is realistic for the Reds. If they take one against San Francisco and San Francisco and they split with the Cubs, I think that's very realistic, especially if Votto keeps up his good play. Number 27 is the Baltimore Orioles, who arguably should be 29 or 30 or 28, but I put them at 27, maybe because I'm overreacting to the 17-1 to game. If on the flip side I put them 30 or 29, then I would have been overreacting to the game in which they lost 15-7 to at home to the Royals. But they rebounded very nicely from that game, and that's why I put them a little bit higher than they probably should be. Because they took two out of three against the Royals, despite them losing that bad on Tuesday. And then they took three out of four from the Rays over the weekend. So a nice homestand considering how Tuesday night's game unfolded. And then the Royals had a big lead on the Orioles on Thursday, and the Orioles came back and won that game on Thursday night. So they're playing a little better of late. They have an interesting week coming up off today. Home Phillies for two. Then four games at Fenway against the Red Sox. So that's going to be an interesting week ahead for Baltimore. Two and four is probably the most realistic scenario for them. One thing on the Orioles, Manny Machado is top five for AL MVP right now. I don't care that the Orioles are 13 and 28 and in last place in the AL East. Machado has been one of the best five players in the American League this year. I think he's going to get traded. And the most likely destination, despite people in Los Angeles saying that it's unrealistic, I think the most likely destination is the Dodgers, considering that they have a need at shortstop now with Corey Seager out for the year. And maybe they can sign him long term. But that's considering the fact that if the Dodgers turn their season around, if the Dodgers don't turn their season around, then the Orioles lose a contender on Machado. Maybe Miguel Andujar regresses and Brandon Drury doesn't come back healthy. Maybe the Yankees trade for him and they stick him at third base. The St. Louis Cardinals make a ton of sense for Machado. They can move Jose Martinez over to first, Matt Carpenter to second, and then you have Machado at short. And, and then you have Jed Jerko at third. And that would be a fearsome team if the Cardinals are to add Machado. The Cubs might be in play for him, but if they do that, they have to include Addison Russell in that deal. And same with the Brewers. If the Brewers want to go out and get Machado, they have to include Orlando Arcia in the deal back to Baltimore. We'll get more into the Machado situation as the trade deadline gets closer. Number 26 is the Kansas City Royals, who reside in fourth place in the American League Central at 13-27. and 27. After destroying the Orioles 15-7 to on Tuesday, they went on to lose the next two, so they lost two out of three in Baltimore. And then they lost two out of three in Cleveland to the Indians. They host the Rays for three beginning tonight with the off day Thursday, and they host the Yankees for three over the weekend. Won't be overly shocked if they go three and three, say they take two out of three from the Rays and they take one from the Yankees. I won't be shocked if they're swept by the Yankees and win two out of three from the Rays. So it's either going to be two and four or three and three for them. If they go better than three and three in this, I think that's gravy for KC. And one thing, quick, quick thing on KC, Mike Moustakas has been awesome for them as well as Jorge Soler. I think those are going to be two coveted guys come the trade deadline, especially Moustakas. I'm interested to see who goes after him in the trade market, as well as Jorge Soler, who looks rejuvenated on the Royals after not really panning out with the Cubs, and then the Cubs trade him away for Wade Davis. But i got to give the Royals some credit now that Soler is starting to pan out a bit. Number 25, I just talked about them a little bit, and that's the Tampa Bay Rays. They're 16-22 and in fourth place in the American League East. They got swept at home by the Braves. That was a two-game set, and they were off on Thursday. And they lost three out of four in Baltimore to the Orioles. They had a doubleheader on Saturday, and they got absolutely destroyed yesterday. That's the case for the Rays being below Baltimore in these rankings, but the Rays 
are 16 and 22, and the Orioles are 13 and 28, and that has something to do with that a little bit. Beginning tonight, they're at KC for three, and they close out the week with four games in Los Angeles against the Angels. If they go better than three and four in that stretch, I'll be shocked. I'll be surprised even if they go three and four. One thing on the Rays, I think it's great that they have a lot of players that Kevin Cash is getting a lot out of, such as Joey Wendell and Daniel Robertson. Wilson Ramos has gotten some hits for them. And Danny Hickavaria is playing okay. I'm interested to see when they call up Christian Arroyo. Blake Snell had a rough start against Baltimore, but before that he was pitching pretty well. Number 24 is the San Diego Padres, who reside at 16-26 and and are in last place in the National League West. They lost two out of three to the Nationals to begin the week, and they closed out the week by splitting with the Cardinals. That's a three and four week for the Padres, and that's pretty good for them, considering that they had some tough teams on the schedule. Starting tonight, they play the Rockies for two games at home. Off day Wednesday, and they have a four-game set in Pittsburgh against the Pirates. That's going to be a tough ask for them. I think 3-3 three and three would be fine for them. One thing on the Padres, they're calling up a young prospect by the name of Franmil Reyes, who leads the minor leagues in home runs. I'm interested to see what kind of boost he can give off offensively. And one thing I forgot to mention last week, On the podcast is that the Padres designated Chase Headley for assignment. They traded for him over the winter in the package that included Brian Mitchell from the Yankees. And I think the Yankees made the right decision by trading away Headley as they've given opportunities to Miguel Andujar and Glaber Torres and Ronald Torres. And that made them trade for Brandon Drury just to have another piece, but on the flip side for the Padres, that trade is looking worse and worse as Mitchell hasn't really panned out and Headley's already designated for assignment. So that's two big-name players this month designated for assignment. First, Matt Harvey, and now Chase Headley. Number 23 is the disaster they are, the Los Angeles Dodgers, 16-24. and They've lost seven of their last eight games. They split with the Diamondbacks in a two-game set, and they got swept by the Reds at home. That's just an outright disaster. Yes, I get it. They lost Clayton Kershaw. Yes, I get it. They lost Corey Seager for the year. Yes, I get it. Justin Turner's not back yet. This is just a disaster. They got Rich Hill back. He hasn't been good in two starts since he's coming back. I'm interested to see if they end up possibly selling at the trading deadline instead of going out and getting Manny Machado. I saw somebody on Twitter the other day tweet out that this Dodgers team reminded them of the 2016 Yankees. I do not agree with them from that standpoint, only because this year's Dodgers team is better on paper than the 2016 Yankees. And the 2016 Yankees, I think Brian Cashman knew that that team wasn't very good, and he knew that he had to reboot that farm system because I think that front office knew that that 2015 season was an aberration with a bunch of veterans on that team, such as Mark Teixeira and Alex Rodriguez and Brian McCann. And Jacoby Ellsbury was actually not hurt that much that season. Brett Gardner had a career year in 2016, even though he was good in 2017 as well. But Brian Cashman knew that that 2015 team was not very good and his starting pitching wasn't very good. And a bunch of those guys, such as Nathan Avaldi and... Michael Pineda have overachieved a little bit in 2015. And they tried to trade away Andrew Miller in December of 2015 at the winter meetings that year, but they couldn't get a deal done. But they ended up trading him that summer. And the rest is history for the Yankees as they are now the best team in baseball and, in my opinion, the favorite to win the World Series this year along with the Astros. And I think, just think the Dodgers have a lot of talent that's currently on the disabled list. And if they get Turner and Kershaw back in time, I think the Dodgers are capable of making a run. That's the difference between the Yankees of two years ago and the Dodgers right now. And one quick thing on the Dodgers. Ross Stripling, I think, has actually pitched pretty well for them in his couple starts. 
And if I'm Dave Roberts, you keep him in the rotation until Clayton Kershaw comes back. Then you put him back in the long man role in that bullpen. Number 22 is the Texas Rangers, who currently sit at 16 and 26 and in last place in the American League West. They began the week winning two out of three against the Tigers, and they closed out the week by losing two out of three to Houston in Houston against the Astros. So three and three for them, predictable. I can't punish them for three and three, especially when the the last three is against the reigning world champions. This week, they're off today, starting tomorrow, two games in Seattle against the Mariners, and they close out the week with four games in Chicago against the White Sox. Won't be shocked if that's 3-3 three and three for the Rangers. And one thing, Nomar Mazzara had a fantastic week. Will he be my pick to win the American League Player of the Week? Stay tuned. But yeah, he's turned into a nice player for the Rangers, and I think he'll eventually be a keeper for them long term. Number 21 is the Detroit Tigers, who currently reside at 17-22 and 22 and in third place in the American League Central. They began the week losing two out of three to the Rangers, and they closed out the week by winning two out of three against the Mariners. So three and three for the Tigers, so I can't really punish them for that, considering that the one series was at home and the other was on the road. The Mariners are a better team than the Tigers, so I have to give the Tigers a little bit of credit for beating a more superior team in a series. A tough week for them ahead. Beginning tonight, they host the Indians for three. And they close out the week by playing the Mariners again, except this time in Seattle. If they go better than three and four, I'd be shocked, honestly. Three and four is actually pretty good for them, considering that if they were to get a split in Seattle and lose two out of three to the Indians, who are starting to play a little bit better lately, and they'll get to the Indians in a little bit, as well as the Mariners then if you're Detroit, you take that. Number 20 is the Minnesota Twins, who currently sit in second place in the American League Central at 17-19. and 19. They swept the Cardinals in St. Louis to begin the week, and they closed out the week by splitting a four-game set in Los Angeles against the Angels. The Twins probably should be higher than this because they actually had a pretty good week. But they are in the worst division in baseball, that is the American League Central, and if they have another good week, they'll probably move up in these rankings. Today is a makeup game against the Mariners at home. Then beginning tomorrow, a two-game set. As the Cardinals come to town, tomorrow night's game's on FS1. And they close out the week by hosting the Brewers for three. So all home games, three and three or better, would be a good week for the Minnesota Twins. One quick thing for the Twins, Byron Buxton's off the disabled list. Let's see if he looks like the player that he was at the end of last year. And he better be because the Twins need that if they are to get back in the American League pennant race. Number 19 is the Oakland Athletics, who currently sit in fourth place in the American League West at 19 and 21. They began the week by getting swept by the reigning world champion Houston Astros. They got the straight on Monday and they hung in those games on Tuesday and Wednesday. And they closed out the week by losing two out of three in New York against the Yankees. They could have won on Saturday, but they couldn't capitalize with bases loaded, nobody out when Aroldis Chapman was in the mound in, on, in the ninth inning. But the Yankees made a couple great plays defensively, give them credit too. But Oakland could have easily won on Saturday, but they didn't. Tough week for them as they begin the week tonight at Fenway against the Red Sox. And they close out the week with four games in Toronto against the Blue Jays. I think three and four is the most likely outcome for them. One quick note on the athletics. Kendall Graveman actually pitched pretty well against the Yankees. Was that a fluke or is that a sign of better things to come? It remains to be seen. Number 18 is the New York Mets who currently sit in fourth place in the NL East at 19 and 18. They had a disastrous week in my opinion. Losing two out of three to the Reds. Disastrous only because of the batting out of order thing. And they won on Monday. And they pulled the game out of their butts on Friday. As they were trailing one nothing going into the ninth inning. As 
Michael Conforto and Devin Mezzarocco played hero ball for them and snuck out a win on Friday. They could have easily lost that game. Then they lost yesterday to the Phillies. Tough week for them coming up, though. But they're lucky because they're home games. Off day today, two against the Blue Jays at home. Off day Thursday. Then the Diamondbacks come into town for three. I'm interested to see how they do in those five games. If they go three and two or better, then they're in good shape. One quick note on the Mets. Michael Conforto is starting to show signs of life a little bit since coming back from the disabled list. If he starts to get going, and Cespedes homered yesterday too. If those two guys start to get rolling, then the Mets offense maybe will turn around a little bit and give fans some hope as they look to look like the team that started 11-1 rather than the team that we've seen the last couple weeks. Number 17 is the San Francisco Giants, who are currently in third place in the NL West at 20-21. and 21. They probably should be lower than this. But the ineptitude of the Mets is the reason why they're not lower. They began the week by getting swept in Philadelphia by the Phillies and getting absolutely waxed in two of those games. And they lost two out of three in Pittsburgh against the Pirates. There's a nice bounce back effort for them on Sunday. They begin the week beginning tonight at home against the Cincinnati Reds. And they close out the week hosting the Rockies. They have to go four and three or better in order for this week for them to be good. And you can't take the Reds for granted. They're playing with house money right now. Six straight wins. I don't remember the Reds ever winning six straight games in a couple of years. But give the new manager credit. Joey Votto deserves credit too. I talked about them before. But if you're San Francisco, you can't take them for granted. Number 16 is the Toronto Blue Jays. One quick note on the Giants. Johnny Cueto on the disabled list. He's going to miss some time, and that's a big loss for the Giants as Cueto was pitching brilliantly. Looked like the Cueto from the Cincinnati Reds. And he was on his way to be becoming one of the prominent guys available on the trade market. Number 16 is the Toronto Blue Jays, who currently sit in third place in the American League East at 21-20. and 20. They did not have a good week. They lost two out of three against the Mariners, including being no hit on Tuesday by James Paxton. And they closed out the week by losing two out of three against the Red Sox. Could have easily been swept, but Luke Maley was the hero for them on Friday night as they avoided the sweep a little bit. Interesting week for them coming up. Off day today, two against the Mets at City Field. And they close out the week. Hosting the Athletics for four. Saturday's game will be on FS1. They got to go 3-3 three three or better here. Perhaps better because of how good the Yanks and the Red Sox are. And, that, and let's face it, the loser between Yanks and Red Sox is going to be hosting the wild card game. And it looks like the Los Angeles Angels are the runaway favorite to be the team that's going to be traveling in the wild card game. But barring a collapse by them or uh, somebody else getting hot, then it, the American League playoff field looks like it's pretty much set. And one quick thing on the Blue Jays, Luke Maley's actually been a pretty nice backup catcher for them, come up with some big hits, and deserves a lot of credit for doing a good job. Maybe he becomes a trade target for somebody if the Blue Jays are out of contention. We'll see about that. Number 15 is the Colorado Rockies, who currently sit in second place in the National League West with a record of 22-19. and They split with the Angels, and they followed it up by losing 3-4 out of four to the Brewers. So a disappointing week for the Rockies, in my opinion. Beginning tonight, a two-game set in San Diego against the Padres. Off day Wednesday, and then they have four games in San Francisco against the Giants. Three and three is the most likely outcome for that, in my opinion. 
One quick thing on the Rockies, David Dahl has played really well for them. He's hit a couple homers, and he's getting a lot more playing time as he deserves. Number 14 is the Cleveland Indians, who currently sit in first place in the American League Central at 20-19. and They're starting to play a little better. This week, they're at the Tigers for three beginning tonight. Off day Thursday, then three against the reigning world champion Houston Astros. If they go worse than four and two here, I think it's a disappointment. And they have to perform against Houston. Because this is going to be one of their few tests of the year. Playing a good team. Because the division that they're in doesn't feature a team like Houston. And they just got swept by the Yankees, uh, Cleveland did, a week ago. So, they got to at least go to Houston and at least win one or two games there. I think a sweep in Houston for them is very, very unlikely. Considering how well Houston's playing right now, get to them in a couple minutes. Number 13, the Seattle Mariners, who currently sit in third place in the American League West at 22 and 17. They went 3 and 3 last week, winning 2 out of 3 in Toronto against the Blue Jays. James Paxton with the no-hitter on Tuesday. Friday's game was right now. They had a doubleheader Saturday and they lost 2 out of 3 over the weekend in Detroit against the Tigers. Makeup game tonight in Minnesota against the Twins, followed by Two games at home against the Rangers, and they close out the week with four games at home against the Tigers. They got to go four and three or better. One quick throw on the Mariners. Robinson Cano is out for a couple months with the fractured wrist. This is a big loss for the Mariners, and their offense, I think, will struggle without him. Number 12 is the St. Louis Cardinals, who currently sit in second place in the National League Central with a record of 22-16. They did not have a good week, got swept at home by the Twins, followed it up by splitting in San Diego against the Padres, so 2-4. and four. Off today at the Twins for two, then host the Phillies for four. They got to get out of that week 3-3 three and three or better. The Phillies will be an interesting series. I'm interested to see how the Phillies perform, though. I'll get to the Phillies in a couple of minutes. One thing on the Cardinals, I think Harrison Bader has played pretty well for them, and he's emerging as a keeper for them a little bit. Number 11 is the Pittsburgh Pirates, third place in the National League Central, 23-17. and 17. They just had a better week than the Cardinals. That's why they're ahead of the Cardinals. They swept the White Sox in Chicago, followed it up by winning two out of three against the Giants. All home games this week, off day today, two against the White Sox and then four against the Padres. They got to get out of that three and three or better. One thing on the Pirates, Elias Diaz has been solid for them as a backup catcher, and he's earned more playing time for them, and rightfully so. Number 10 is the Philadelphia Phillies, currently in second place in the National League East at 23-16. and 16. They are coming off a very good week, in my opinion. They swept the Giants and followed it up by splitting with the Mets. They had a game on Saturday that was postponed to August 16th, but overall, good week for the Phillies. This upcoming week, at the Orioles for two, beginning tomorrow, and they close out at the Cardinals for four. They'll be fine if they go three and three. One thing about the Phillies, Aaron Nola, despite giving up a bunch of hits and walks in his last start, has just been brilliant and is emerging as a top pitcher in the National League. Number nine, is the Chicago Cubs, who currently sit in fourth place in the National League Central at 21-16. and They had a good week, so they deserve to be in the top ten. They swept the Marlins, and they won two out of three against the White Sox. They begin the week hosting the Braves in a makeup game. Then they go to the Braves for three and they close out the week, four games at the Reds, Saturday doubleheader. They have to go better than 4-4. Four and four. And don't take the Reds, or the Braves for that matter, for granted if you're Chicago. 
One thing about the Cubs, John Lester is starting to look like the John Lester of old again. He had one bad start all year, which was in Miami against the Marlins. Other than that, he's been absolutely brilliant. Number eight is the Arizona Diamondbacks, who are 24-16 and 16 on the year. First place in the National League West. They had a really bad week this week and still sit at number eight in my power rankings. They split with the Dodgers to begin the week in Los Angeles. And they got swept at home by the Nationals, which isn't good. Tough week ahead for them, too, as beginning tonight. The Brewers come to town off day Thursday, then three at City Field. Three and three, and they should be fine. One thing about the Diamondbacks, I think Patrick Corbin in a contract year has pitched very, very well for them. Number seven is the Los Angeles Angels, currently sitting in second place in the American League West at 24 and 16. They had an interesting week, split with the Rockies at Coors Field, and they split with the Twins at home. A test for them beginning tonight as the reigning world champion Houston Astros come to town for three and they close out the week by hosting the Rays for four. If they do worse than four and three, I think it's a disappointment. One thing about the Angels, Shohei Otani's just been absolutely brilliant on the mound and at the plate. I think he's the favorite for the rookie of the year right now in the American League. If he starts to regress a little bit, then Gleyber Torres from the Yankees will become the favorite. And I'll get to the Yankees in a moment. Number six is the Milwaukee Brewers, who currently reside in first place in the National League Central at 24-17. and 17. I think they had a really good week. They split a two-game set at home against the Indians, and they followed that up by winning three out of four at the Rockies, which is impressive. Beginning tonight, they're at the Diamondbacks for three, off day Thursday, then at the Twins for three. I think they'd be okay with going three and three. One thing on the Brewers is that Freddy Peralta was just absolutely brilliant in his big league debut, and I think he should stay in the rotation for now. Number five is the Washington Nationals, who had a really good week this week, 24-18. and 18. And they're only in third place in the National League East. I think they're the best team in the National League right now, although the Braves have something to say about that. But I just like the Nationals front starting pitching better than Atlanta's. The Nationals won two out of three in San Diego against the Padres. Could have easily swept the Padres, then they swept the Diamondbacks in Arizona. That was impressive. Off day today, two against the Yankees at home. Off day Thursday, three against the Dodgers at home. I think they'd be okay with going three and two, considering how well the Yankees are playing right now. One thing on the Nationals, Bryce Harper is starting to look like the front runner for National League MVP. He had a monster home run last night. He has 13 on the year. That's tied for the Major League lead. I think he's going to be motivated to play against the Yankees this week. Number Number four, the Atlanta Braves, a National League best, 24-15, first place in the NL East. They're just on a roll right now, the Braves are. A very good week for them, swept the Rays in Tampa Bay, then winners of three out of four in Miami against the Marlins. Right now they're playing the Cubs in Chicago, and after that they actually play the Cubs in their home ballpark for three. Today's game's a makeup game. And over the weekend, they have the Marlins for three at home. They should go four and three or better in this stretch. One thing on the Braves is that their rotation as a whole has been absolutely brilliant. Mike Falta Unich and Sean Newcomb have absolutely been great for them. Yet the Yes Network's Michael K had compared this year's Braves to last year's Yankees. So that's a fun comparison for them. You can make the case for that. Number three is the Houston Astros. First place in the American League West, 26-16 and 16 on the year. They had a really good week. They swept Oakland, and they went two out of three against the Rangers. They could have easily swept the Rangers, but Cole Hamels was really good in that first game. They begin the week at the Angels starting tonight, then the off day Thursday, then three at home against the Cleveland Indians with Sunday night's game being on ESPN for Sunday night baseball. Number two is the Boston Red Sox tied with the Yankees for the best record in baseball at 28-12, tied for first place in the American League East as well. 
They began the week by losing two out of three to the Yankees, and they closed out the week by winning two out of three in Toronto against the Blue Jays. This upcoming week, they host the A's beginning tonight, then a four-game set at home against the Orioles. They have to go four and three or better, or else that's a little bit of a letdown. One thing about the Red Sox is that Hanley Ramirez and J.D. Martinez are starting to heat up for them. And that's good for that offense, considering that Mookie Betts has fallen off a little bit. And one thing about Houston is that Carlos Correa has had a monster month thus far. He's certainly in play for the American League Player of the Month award. Number one is the New York Yankees, tied for the best record of baseball, 28-12. and 12, Tied for first place in the American League East with the Red Sox as well. They deserve this ranking. This is our third straight week at number one. They won two out of three against the Red Sox and followed it up by winning two out of three against the Athletics. This upcoming week, they're at the Nationals for two with the off day today, then another off day on Thursday, then at Kansas City for three. So I think the Yankees would take a three and two week. Say they split with the Nats and win two out of three in KC. And I won't be shocked if it's even four and one or five and oh. I think anything short of three and two is a disappointment for the Yankees this week. And one thing for the Yankees is that Giancarlo Stanton's heating up for them. He has five home runs in the month of May. He had five home runs all of April as his average has gone up from like 209 to 252 or something like that as Stanton has seen to turn the corner. Quick mock draft. I'm just going to go with the team and the player and a quick little description. Detroit Tigers at number one, Casey Mize, the righty from Auburn. Mize is thought out to be the best player in this draft class, and he could very well be a number one, number two starter. Number two, San Francisco Giants, Brady Singer, the ready from Florida. Singer was the preseason top player, and there's people saying that there's a chance he could go number one over Mize. Number three, Philadelphia Phillies, Nick Madrigal, the second baseman from Oregon State. There's an argument out there that Madrigal's the best overall player in the draft class, and there's a distinct possibility that Madrigal is the first position player off the board in the draft. Number four is the Chicago White Sox. Matthew Libitor, the lefty from Mountain Ridge High School in Arizona. He's the top high school arm in this draft class. And people think that he could go as high as number two. Number five is the Reds. Carter Stewart, the righty from EU Galley High School in Florida. A strong summer absolutely has helped Stewart's case. He's an above-average pitcher. And he's above average pitches. Number six is the New York Mets. Joey Bart, the catcher from Georgia Tech. Bart opened the year as an elite defensive catcher. His offensive game is improving. The Mets have a need long-term at that position. And the Mets are the obvious fit for Bart. Number seven is the San Diego Padres. Shane McClanahan, the lefty from South Florida. McClanahan has been a little inconsistent. There's a chance he drops out of the top ten. But his talent alone should keep him in the top ten. Number eight is the Atlanta Braves. Ethan Hawkins, the righty from Forsyth High School in Georgia. He's a top ten talent that's had a rough spring. He has a Vanderbilt commit, but who knows if he's drafted this high that he'd pass on Vanderbilt to try to pursue a big league career. Number nine, the Oakland Athletics. Travis Swaggerty, the outfielder from South Alabama. He's an above-average outfielder, could be an elite leadoff man with 15-plus homer pop. Number 10, Pittsburgh Pirates, Jared Kalenic, the outfielder from Waukesha West High School in Wisconsin. Kalenic is a fast riser, and there's people out there that are saying that Kalenic could go as high as number 2. The Pirates would be fortunate to get him here at 10. Number 11 is the Baltimore Orioles. Nolan Gorman, the third baseman from Sandra Day O'Connor High School in Arizona. Gorman is an elite power hitter. There's people saying that he may not project to be a third baseman long term, although he has a good arm. 12, the Toronto Blue Jays. Ryan Releason, the lefty from Ole Miss. Releason's unlikely to go in the top 10. I think he's more likely to go as high as number 11 to the Orioles, if not here. He's a good breaking ball, some other good pitches. He'd be a guy that would fit nicely in Toronto's system. 13, the Marlins. 
Jackson Kawar, the righty from Florida. A really good fastball, a really good changeup, a good curveball. He's somebody that can move up quickly in the Marlins system. Number 14, the Seattle Mariners. Jonathan India, the third baseman from Florida. India is somebody that rightfully came back for a senior year and improved as a player and improved his stock. He is a above average defense and can be a top five pick in this draft. Number 15 is the Texas Rangers. Cole Wynn, the righty from Orange Lutheran High School in California. He has three really good pitches. He's somebody that transferred to California for baseball, and that seems like a good decision. Number 16 is the Tampa Bay Rays. Bryce Tarang, the shortstop from San Diego High School in California. He's somebody that can flat out field the ball. He's above average. Good leadership skills and compared to Dansby Swanson. 17, the Los Angeles Angels. Kumar Rocker, the righty from North Oconee High School in Georgia. He has a mature body for a high schooler. He's impressed with a double fastball. Scouts worry about some bad weight. But he's athletic off the mound. But he just has to be more consistent with his pitches. Number 18 is the Kansas City Royals. Logan Gilbert, the righty from Stetson. Jacob DeGrom and Corey Kluber went to Stetson, so that's good history. Gilbert's someone that doesn't offer an elite fastball, but he has above average control of all of his pitches, and he has a great frame. Number 19 is the St. Louis Cardinals. Grayson Genesa, the first baseman, outfielder from Wichita State. Janista's a fast riser. He's impressed some scouts with tools last summer. He's a good athlete, except he has a hulking Thing to him, which makes some scouts worried. Number 20, Minnesota Twins, Alec Bohm, the third baseman for Wichita State. Bohm, I think, is the best hitter in this draft class. He has improved defensively as well. He's somebody that I've seen compared to Chris Bryant. 21, Milwaukee Brewers, Ryan Weathers, the lefty from Loretto High School in Tennessee. He's a good athlete. He has a good balance of pitches, three above average pitches and plus control. And he's somebody that can move up on people's mock boards. 22, the Colorado Rockies. Grayson Rodriguez, the ready from Central Heights High School in Texas. He's somebody that's trended upward this year. He's a good fastball. And he has four above-average pitches. He has a good downhill plane. 23, the New York Yankees. Tristan Beck, the righty from Stanford. He has the frame and loose arm to project additional velocity. He has a good feel for change and control of all three pitches. He was drafted last year, but he rightfully decided to go back to school. 24, the Chicago Cubs. Sean Hagelli, the righty from Kentucky. He's somebody... That's impressed in Kentucky. He's an elite downward plane. He has a low 90s fastball. An easy delivery. And somebody that I think would fit nicely with the Cubs. 25, the Diamondbacks. Steel Walker, the outfielder from Oklahoma. His best tool is his bat. He has outstanding instincts. He is somebody that would intrigue the Diamondbacks due to the fact that he's one of the better offensive performers in college this year. Number 26, the Boston Red Sox. Jeremy Ehrman, the shortstop from Missouri State. Ehrman would be excellent here, and he could play short or second for many teams. He has a double-plus arm. Number 27, the Washington Nationals. Tristan Casas, corner infielder from American Heritage High School in Florida. He's one of the more impressive power hitters of the draft class. But his defense is a work in progress as he has to do some trimming down on his body. 28, the Houston Astros, Connor Scott, the outfielder from Plant High School. He's one of the faster athletes in this draft class. He's a good defender, good range, and he has a solid bat with raw power. 29, the Cleveland Indians, Noah Naylor, the catcher, and third baseman from St. Joan of Arc Catholic High School in Ontario. 
He's a lefty, very high athleticism level. He may be better off at third base because of his athleticism. So he can maximize those two talent areas. And number 30 is the Los Angeles Dodgers. Will Banfield, the catcher from Brookwood High School in Georgia. He's somebody that could evolve into an average big league hitter after surviving being a minor league catcher, starting at the lowest level. His defense should guarantee a solid chance of at least becoming a big league backup alone. So that's it for the mock draft, and that's it for today's podcast. I'll be back tomorrow recapping Rockets Warriors Game 1 from Houston, looking ahead to Game 2 between the Cavs and the Celtics, looking ahead to the NBA Draft Lottery, Stanley Cup playoffs, recapping the Game 2 of the Jets and the Golden Knights, looking ahead to Game 3 between the Caps and the Bolts from D.C., and going over all the baseball news and whatnot. I hope you guys have a great day, everybody.